Welcome to Engage for Influence. I am Charlana Kelly. I am so excited that you are here today. We have been learning about why we need to engage and today is really a paradigm shift. It's a paradigm shift because we have to learn how to live this life and impart the things that are going to bring power into the lives of others. Stay tuned and you'll learn much. At the end, I have an announcement. We've been talking about why we need to engage. In the last episode, I shared with you about the four C's of the apostasy, the great falling away that we are going to witness before the end will come. I thank God that we have an opportunity right now to be the best that we've ever been throughout all of history. And when I say we, I mean the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is made up of millions and millions of people around the world. It's our time to step forward and have the answer and do what the Lord has shown us to do in His Word and with the hope and desire that many souls will be reaped and brought into the kingdom. We're still talking about why we need to engage. Last week, I talked a little bit about the fact that Christianity, especially in the Western world, is on the decline. And so we need to engage, and engage is an action word. We have something that we need to do, and we have something that we need to enforce. We also spoke a little bit last week about the fact that <clears throat> Satan has been disarmed. The only weapon he has against you and I is lies. It's lies. When we believe a lie, then we've been deceived. When we allow lies to come in, we need to get them out of our heart. And so it was a time to search our own heart, but also to realize that the people around us are dealing with the same things as well. So we want to be an agent of change, and we want to help people find Christ, and we want to advance the kingdom of God, and certainly we want to take back ground that has been ceded to the enemy because of our toleration of sin, advocation for sin, and actually the, that all begins as we mentioned or I talked to you about last week that we become complacent and we fall out of love with Christ. Well this week we're going to take the next step <laughs> and I'm so excited each week to take the next step because each week is building on the previous week and God is doing something. We're going to learn how to build a mighty edifice, erect a strong tower around us to keep us safe in every storm, but we're also going to learn and do this together, dig a very deep foundation into him. So there's no way that the enemy could do anything that would take us off task or cause us to question our God, our Lord. We're going to remain firm and strong to the end, courageous and unafraid. Amen. Today we're going to talk about the fact that if not Christ, no one, you may be the only Christ that people will ever see. We're going to really spend most of our time talking about the scripture in John 14. I'm not going to read it verbatim, but I'll touch on a few scriptures as we go through. But John 14 is such a perfect example of how we are supposed to live our life in this time. In verses 1 through 11, Jesus is talking to his disciples about the fact that he's going to leave. They still don't really understand it. And Jesus continues to say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The things that I do, the Father is doing through me. What you have seen, I need you. I desire that you would believe. But listen, he makes it very, very clear in verse 6 that he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life, 
and no one goes to the Father except through Jesus. I want to break those words down here in just a minute, but before I do, I want to say that there are people even in the church that say they're Christians, but they also would say, well, there's there might be one more than one way to heaven. You know, there's this big move. I mentioned it last week where a whole segment of people who identify as Christians believe there is no hell. So when you begin to uh, accept those lies, believe those lies, then really and truly the devil can take you any way he wants to. So we've got to come back to center and, and reaffirm that Jesus is the only way to the Father. He's the only way of salvation. He's the only way through faith in him that we will have the life that he's talking about here in verse 6 that he has come to give us that we find in him. So let's look at this. He's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. And no one goes to the Father except through him. That word way there actually is hodas in the Greek. And it means the means and the journey. In other words, he's the only means by which you can come to the Father. And he is the journey upon which you will get there. In other words, we give our heart and our mind, our life to the Lord. We repent. We make him the Lord and Savior of our life. And we begin this journey. So he was the means to which we found salvation. We found redemption through him. He was the means. What he did on the cross was the means by which we would find salvation. And then we commit in our walk with him to go with him on this journey as we journey on up into our reward in heaven. I'm excited about that. I don't know about you. But he also says, I'm the truth. And the very essence of this Greek word, which is aletheia, or some people call it aletheia, it is, I'm true. I am the truth. What I have told you is right. What I have told you is true. It, it is proven. It can be proven. Many people won't prove it until they get there, but I'm going to tell you something. I have proven him over and over and over again in my own life by the, the challenges and trials and testimonies that have been produced by those. I see him move miraculously all the time in such sweet ways and such powerful and mighty ways. So he is true. And as we walk with him, as we journey with him through this life, we will prove him true as well. And then this word life, he said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I am the life. This word here is Zoe. And it means the God kind of life. Literally, it means eternal life. And so when Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, he's saying, I have given you eternal life. If you, if you give your heart to me, if you, if you repent and give your life to me and find the way and you journey with me, you will prove that I am true and your reward will be Zoe life the God kind of life in the here and now, we're not going to need it in, in heaven, right? We can have heaven on earth. We can be a demonstration of what eternal life is going to look like as far as the peace, the quiet assurance that we have when we know that we are his and all the things that are characteristic of God can be manifest through us to the world. That's why I'm saying you may be the only Christ someone ever sees. I really believe that more people are one to the kingdom of God by our daily living this out. One of the things Jesus says in John 14, 1 through 11, he says, you ought to be happy that I'm going to my father because I'm going, I'm going to give you a helper, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. He's going to, he's going to lead and teach and guide you in all truth. I'm giving you someone to help you, an advocate even, who will walk with you in this. He's at the throne advocating. The advocate is in us. He is working through us to fulfill God's plan, not only for our life, but for the lives of the people that are around us. 
he, he says there also that if you love me, you will obey me. I think this is a big, big, big key for people who are walking with Jesus. You know, if we don't love him, love his word, if we're not grateful for what he has done, then his commandments are going to be drudgery. And that's called the law. That's called legalism. We do it because we have to. We feel like we have to do it to gain something, to gain him, to gain eternal life and all of that. And there are good works that we do. But listen, when you love him, just like we talked about last week, when love waxes cold, the next thing is compromise, right? We become complacent, we fall out of love, and then we compromise. And then if we don't get checked there and turn around, and this is what has happened to so many people around us, this is why we've got to get back in there and we've got to start living this life for the sake of others. But, you know, ultimately, if our compromise does not go unchecked and we don't turn around there, then we're going to end up advocating for sin. God God forbid we can still turn around from there, but I'm telling you the devastation of lives who believe that God is winking at sin and okay with sin and he's okay with sexual immorality when his word clearly says that he is not. Jesus said, spoke about it himself. People want to kind of erase those red words. But, you know, when we go down that road, there's there's you know, we can find our way back, but the devastation of other lives in the process of it is, is really frightening to me. I would want to go back and go to each person face to face and go, I was wrong. And let me tell you why. But he says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. And he goes on to say, after that, you will ask what you will in my name and I give it, I will give it to you. That is a powerful statement there, but I'm going to tell you the po most powerful part of that statement is that when you love him and you are obeying him, then you are pursuing his will in your life. You are pursuing his character. You are pursuing his presence. You are, you are going after everything that he has to offer you. And so sure, what are your prayers going to be? Your prayers are going to line up with God's will. Your prayers are going to be hungry to see him fulfill what he's promised he would do. So yes, anything we ask in his will, he will do for us. Now, Jesus also says in here that because he's going to the Father, that we're going to do greater works than he did. What did he do? He laid hands on the sick, he cast out demons, and he raised the dead. And he also taught and trained and raised up disciples. And so he's calling us to do the same thing. And if we're possibly going to be the only Jesus that, that they will ever see in a world where people think there are many ways to get to heaven or back into uh, the place of our creator, then you know, we've got to live this life like he would. We've got to, got to be ready in season and out to speak a word to him who is weary. We'll talk a little more about that next week. And I'll share some of those things at the end. We're going to talk about being a messenger and being God's spokesman next week. And really and truly, what does that look like? But, but you are to be doing the same things that he did. And as you live your life that way, this really kind of makes me think of Mother Teresa and Mother Teresa, what did she do? She wasn't a street preacher. She went out and picked up the sick and the near dead in her own arms and ministered the love of God to them. You know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. What does that mean? When people see you doing good to others, speaking life and bringing the Zoe life of God into the people around you, when they have a problem, listen, they're going to know who to come to and it's going to be you. <laughs> they're going to come looking for the one who they know knows their God. You know, Daniel was one. The king, the king would call for him after he realized that Daniel's God was great and that Daniel uh, heard from his God. He was God's spokesman in that season. And so start beginning to, to look for opportunities where you can pray for people, where you can speak a good word into them, because the one thing that people all around the world are looking for is peace. 
And peace can really only come through Christ and through God. A little bit of my testimony is that I was born again as a child, had some radical and powerful encounters with Jesus as early as four years old, read the Bible from cover to cover at 10, gave my heart to Jesus, was radically saved at that time. But because I was so young and I didn't live in a Christian home, I fell away. I didn't have any support. I didn't have any any Christians around me that I could connect with. And so I connected with the wrong people and I went the wrong way. But years later, I would begin to recognize the peace of God on the faces of those who knew him. And I recognized that it was the peace of God. That's the powerful thing to me. And I had a a life that was blessed. I wasn't you know, destitute or anything, but I needed peace and I wanted peace and I saw it on the faces of those who knew him. And let me tell you something, I went after it. In John 14, verse 27, Jesus says this. He says, I am going to give you a gift. I am going to give you my peace. Not as the world gives, because you see, there is a false sense of peace. And that peace is not stable at all. That's a fleeting peace. One day you're up, the next day you're down. One day you feel it, the next day you don't. One day I think this, the next day you go, no, I think that. There's no stability in the life of one who is living off of the world's peace or man's peace. When Jesus said, I'm going to give you my peace, peace that the world cannot give, I give you. Let's read it. He says this, peace I leave with you, my peace, my peace, I give you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You see, when we have the peace of God in our heart, there is nothing that can topple us over because what brings the peace of God is that we are settled, settled, settled. We're not tossed to and fro. We're not running after every wind of doctrine. We're not seeking for ourselves teachers, heaping them up, but never coming to the knowledge of truth. We are settled. We're settled on Him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. We have decided to journey with Him. We have proven that He is true by our own experience, and we're going after Him. We're headed towards that Zoe God kind of life, ever increasing on the inside of us. This word right here, peace, in the Greek, is erani. It's actually E-O, I think, R-E-N-E. But this peace is kind of interesting. It's not the shalom kind of peace, which is nothing missing, nothing broken. The wholeness in Christ, you know, that sozo kind of life. This peace literally means one. I love that. I love that idea. One, I'm going to give you my peace. I'm going to make you one with me, with the Holy Spirit, and with the Father. I'm not going to get too deep into this, but it reminds me of John 17, where we get the for the first time to hear a lengthy prayer of Jesus with his Father about making us one with him. This peace is such an integral part of that. It means one, it means quietness, it means rest. It means that we're settled, like I just said, we've settled ourselves on Him. Nothing's going to come in, no thought, no lie. Nothing can move us off of what we believe. We're going to stay. We're going to abide in that with Him. Actually, the next chapter, John 15, we're not going to go there, talks about abiding in the vine interesting the progression there but this peace erani peace means one paul said something in romans chapter 8 verse 14 he said the sons of god are led by the peace of god that same stabilizing oneness with god settled in him We're led by that. We're not moved by the world's peace. We're not moved by man's tradition. We're not moved by vain arguments. 
We're not moved by opinions. We know the word, we know our Christ, we know our God, and we're settled, and because of it, we have peace. We're walking in peace. You know, in the epistles, the word says that the peace of God will literally mount up garrison around us. Peace is like a fortified defense around us. And really, when you have the peace of God, it's like the manifest presence of God being upon your life. You know, there are several places in the Old Testament where the prophets would say, you, you have cried out peace. You say, peace, peace, but there is none. And even says that a false prophet will himself say there's peace when there's not peace. Well, you know what? We ought to be able to look at a situation and recognize whether there's peace or not. But, you know, some people can look at something and see, see completely differently than what the truth is because they have blinders on their eyes. They cannot yet see the truth. You know, one of the greatest prayers we can pray for people is that those blinders would be removed from their eyes, their ears would be open, their heart would be opened so that they can receive the truth of God. Amen. I think it was in Jeremiah 6.14 and then in a couple of places in the book of Ezekiel where people were crying out for peace, but there was none. We need to stay, stay so settled in God that we are not moved by anything around us. So you are yourself, you yourself are a peacemaker. That's what Jesus spoke about in the Sermon on the Mount. He talked about the peacemakers there. And James, in James 3.18, he spoke about the peacemakers. He actually said the peacemakers sow in peace and reap the fruit of righteousness as a result. The prophet Isaiah also spoke about peace. Peace is actually the outworking of doing right. <laughs> And, th and this is confirmed by the words of the prophet Isaiah, who said, He who keeps his mind stayed on me, I will keep him in perfect peace. So keeping our mind stayed on him keeps us in perfect peace. But he also said, the fruit of peace is righteousness. The fruit of peace is righteousness. Or the manifestation of peace follows when we do what is right. Well, what is right? Making peace, right? So you are yourself as part of this living your life so that other people's can, people can see the Father. Like Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So people ought to say, if I've seen Charlana, I've seen the Father. Or if I've seen you, the viewer, whoever you are, you wonderful people, I love you so much, whoever you are, if they've seen you, they've seen the Father. That should be the way we live our life. And, and we shouldn't have to say that to people. They ought to come and go, I see that you know God. I see that there is something in you that is different and I want it, like me going after the peace that I saw on the faces of the people who knew him. And so we should impart peace in every situation we are in. It's as easy as just stepping back for a moment and going, okay, Father, what can I say to bring peace? You don't have to say it out of your mouth, just think it. God knows your thoughts. He even knows the intents of your heart. And so, Father, how can I bring peace to this situation? It might be your family, it might be your workplace, it might be in the marketplace somewhere. You know, it could be even in a governmental structure, in a business. It could be in an educational situation. How can I be a minister of peace to these people? Because, as we're going to see next next episode, you're the answer. You have the answer, but your answers are going to come from heaven. And the first way to get that download from heaven is to say, how can I bring peace here? How can I live like Christ here in such a way that people will come to me and say, I see that you know him. I, I need to know him too. That's how we engage. That's how we begin to effect change 
and begin to shift even the atmosphere because I'm telling you if you walk in peace the people around you recognize that you walk in peace and they will want to come and sit with you they will want to come and be with you and hear from you I'm gonna close on that note today I want to pray for people today you know our world is so cause oriented now we're, we're more so cause-oriented than we are Christ-oriented. And again, that gets us into legalism. It gets us into good works. It doesn't get us into heaven. And so we need to, ourselves, begin to become Christ-oriented. And I have to tell you something. People who are cause-oriented, who are works-oriented, they don't really have the peace of God on the inside of them. They are empty. They are empty and they need to be filled up and we're the ones who can touch and pray with them and fill them up we can impart a good word a a wonderful word into them that will breathe new life into them we can share our testimony about what jesus did for us and encourage them to follow him there are all kinds of ways that we can love one another be kind to one another and do God things, do the things that God would have us to do that he will use to draw men, women, and children to Christ. Give him something to work with as you live your day and ask him for opportunity every day too. That's really the best way. I want to pray today for people who are are feeling depressed, feeling a lot of anxiety, even those that might be contemplating suicide. Let me tell you something, life can be good if you follow Christ. And if you have tried that before and you think it didn't work, I'm gonna ask you to get back in there with me. I'm gonna ask you to open your heart and your mind back up to him and ask him to show you his goodness, show you his love, show you his peace. Because people who are depressed and, and uh, having anxiety and suicidal thoughts, they've lost hope. They've lost hope. And I love Isaiah 61. It says in verse 3, I think it is, 60, 61, 1 through 3, all amazing scriptures about what Jesus would do when he would come. One of them is, put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. The spirit of heaviness is all of that. The anxiety and depression, everything that we feel that is weighing us down, begin to praise him, begin to worship him. And right now, in the name of Jesus, I declare and impart to you life everlasting. I say be free from the spirit of anxiety, the spirit of depression, and the spirit of suicide. I speak Zoe into you right now in the name of Jesus. Rise up and live. Rise up and go with Christ who is your peace in the name of Jesus. Thank you for joining me here today. Be sure to tune in next week. We're going to talk about the fact that you have been created for engagement. You're the messenger. You're the spokesman. And we're going to talk about those things next week. God bless you and Godspeed until we meet again.